אני חושב. זה בסדר? נודניק, פשוט נודניק. אוקיי, אז בואו נתחיל. אז אין לי זמן לעבור... זה סקיורטי אוקשן אקזמפל, אבל אני חושב שאתם יודעים את המיין מסג' שיש רשיונל לא נונדט סקיורטי וסקיורטי עם הרבה סנסטיביטי, אז לפחות בפרק של אוקשן פרמורט, שיש את זה שמגיע את הבנפיט של להשתמש את האפסייד בצורה הרבה יותר סגניפיקנט לעומת הנונדט סקיורטי, אבל זה אחרון סטאפ מאשר מרס ומג'לוף. עכשיו, השני טוק הוא על... In the same framework of firms knowing more than investors on the market, but taking it to a very different direction. And this direction is about strategic disclosure. Um, and as I said in my opening description, this is a more explicit communication channel. So it's a question about how firms communicate with the market. Um, so let me... Gore, I don't see Gore here, but if you see him, tell him that I did have some reference to some empirical uh, uh, literature. So this is a study in a, some, uh, an accounting journal, a well-cited paper, Journal of Accounting and Economics by N. Bayer and others. And they did the following uh, experiment. They, on the left-hand side, that was the returns the um, what are that's the number of firms and that's the number of observations yeah okay so many okay. firms many observations all from on, on this all the same the in the summary regression on the left hand side the month return of a specific firm in quarter. Oh, sorry, quarter, okay. uh, quarter return for a specific firm and uh, trying to explain it through different variables and all these variables are information conveyed our communication by the firm so earning announcement management forecast and also uh, some some information that is not being conveyed by the firm itself like analyst forecast and so on so they so they regress the return of the firm in a specific quarter on different information that was released Part of it was released yeah. by the firm, part of it... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that now we're going to have some reference to some empirical... Uh, so many numbers here. <laughs> 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 you complain no matter what I do. <laughs> and... So, so, so when you refer here to the quarter, you turn from which day to which day? Uh, from the announcement to the next announcement? It's, I think it's a year, it's like the first quarter of the year, second quarter of the year, third quarter of the year, fourth quarter of the year. Can't be because EA is one of the variables on the, on the right hand side, earning announcements. Yeah, so there is one earning announcement in this quarter because uh, a firm has to release its earning. Okay. The main message of this, firm, this table is, we, I mean, as Gore said, there are too many numbers here, but the main message here is that you can explain a lot going on with the return of a specific firm by the information conveyed by the firm itself. May it be earning announcement or management forecast or other announcement made by the firm. And some of this information that the firm releases is not mandatory. Management forecast, for example, is not mandatory. Nobody's forcing the firm to, the, the manager of a firm to tell what he thinks is going to happen in the next year or two. So there are many pieces of information that, uh, many pieces of information that firms release and they don't really have to. So they have a lot of flexibility of what and when to release. So looking at just these numbers is a 28%, that's a measure of the R square. So the, uh, the conclusion of this regression that they can explain 28% of the, what happens in the returns in the stock market through this in information event. And you can see that more than half of this piece, that 55% uh, that out of the 28% is, 
is conveyed by information that it's discretionary by the firm. Yeah. There are a lot of numbers that you say. Can you pinpoint to one number and say exactly what yeah. it means? Yeah, so let me say it. So let's start with the 28%. No, no, no. That, no. In the table, in the, in the numbers on top. Ah, let's, so let me I'll start with the 28. A total of 28%, the R square, is a total, uh, a total R square that you can explain through these five variables. This is a measure, this is like R squared decomposition, how much you can explain for different variables. So you can explain a, 20, a total of 28% for these five variables. And out of these 28%, 15% goes to management, to management forecast or 55%, 55% of 28, which is a 15%. I don't know if I... So, again, you run a regression, the left-hand side, the so return. The, the first column on the mean, are these actual numbers of the sec filing? The these are the co this is the coefficients of these variables, but you don't, we don't care about the coefficients. Ah, we care about the r square, how okay. much you can explain sure. to the return through the the abnormal returns. Over how, what a quarter. Over the whole quarter? Over the whole quarter. Sometime during the quarter, it doesn't matter. So there is a qu for each quarter there is an announcement. The quarter. So you say that if you have. So you have an announcement, which may be. I'm pretty sure it's calendar quarters. Uh, yeah. Away. Okay. Let's let's move on. That's not my main purpose. Or main, the main conclusion of this, and we can g we can discuss it, is that there is a lot going on in the stock market in st uh, asset pricing that can be explained what by information that is released by firms, and furthermore, much of the information. Uh, what? Right, but it's still that you can capture the lot of what going on to what happening in the stock market by even just ignoring what information convey in the conference calls. So what you say that maybe there is more information that is revealed to investors, so the number should be higher. Fine. Yeah. So, so management forecasts are discretionary. Yeah. Uh, but if a firm chooses to provide management forecasts, is it committing itself? Doing no. So that actually. It's imp so let me just repeat the question. If a firm that was actually a famous case, Burlington, Burlington Coat, that was issuing management forecasts for a couple of quarters, and stopped to issuing management cost contra uh, forecast in a specific quarter and you know surprise surprise that was a bad quarter that was the following like the first couple of the following couple of quarters were pretty bad so investors sued the firm and said well uh, yes so we're not required to issue this forecast but by following this pattern they implicitly generated a commitment to continue issuing this forecast and the judge ruled out that was voluntary to begin with and the fact that they issued for a couple of quarters did not constitute any obligation to continue to doing so in the future. They probably said, you know, there are some uncertainty events, we don't feel comfortable. Yeah, and you know, the, ma the investors, of course, could draw their own conclusion. What does it mean? that investors, that the management say that, you know, it's, things are unclear. Okay. Whether, is, it clear, is it unclear or is it bad? Clear but bad. Okay. Uh, okay. Here is another...
So I'm not sure I follow, but you can you can partition the set of firms into the one that you can explain the least, that the 21%, the highest, like or the 75% were the highest, 35%. In all of them, uh, you know, the management forecast is an example of a, uh, a very important information piece that is released by the firms. Let, let's, let's not go into the regression. That's not my... Uh, the main focus of what I'm going to talk about. So let me quote. <laughs> uh, let me reference few papers in accounting that all talk about information revealed by firms. So the first paper that I'm going to quote is a paper by David Abudi, Ron Kaznick, again, Journal of Accounting and Economics. And here is some interesting patterns. So they look at firms at firms that they uh, have scheduled an, uh, allocation of options to the management. So some firms every year on a specific date, let's say a week after the, uh, er some earning announcements, award the management some, some fixed allocation of options. So like say 10,000 options and in almost all cases, the strike price equals the current stock price. And they look at what happened to the stock price around this event. And something really strange started showing up. It seems as if, you know, the stock price drops before the award of these options and recover afterwards. And you can think about it, maybe you're a little bit suspicious, but it's really good for the management. Because if you're being offered options where the strike price equals the current stock price, it's in your best interest to have the stock price low when the options are being awarded. Okay, and their conclusion is our findings suggest that CEO makes opportunities, voluntary disclosures that maximize the stock option compensation. Wait, the legal case, is just the that's not backdating, that's, that's a different yeah. version of, that's not cheating, uh, backdating, that's even go beyond of changing the date of the award of the option. So that's not, uh, it's related, but not, <laughs> but not, uh, but not, but different. Okay. You talk about the, I how the let's talk okay, afterwards, I can tell you. They, the, they were contacted by, you know, by people from oh, the, the yeah. Yeah. There were, there were some thoughts about actually taking this into court, but they actually didn't take firms into court based on this pattern. Uh, and the, a different accounting paper, Journal of Accounting Research, Greg Miller, I think goes back to Eric's question. So Greg Miller was uh, looking at a uh, set of firms that were going through first a phase where the, all things went really well. So revenues, profits were all increasing and then hit like a downturn. And here is what they find. They find an increased disclosure during the period of increased earnings. And the increase is pervasive of all types of disclosure tend to be bundled with earning announcements. So with the earning announcement, you know, the firms said a lot of things. They were very transparent of what was going on. They explained what happened in this market, that market, and so on. Issuing forecasts, and all sort of pieces of information. And uh, firms continue to disclose at a high level as they approach earning decline. However, the shift to disclosure that focused on positive short-term results and do not disclose a discount of uh, impending decreases. Okay, so somehow the firm tend to be more opaque. When firms turn bad, they just claim that it's unclear. The future is unclear. It's not clear but bad but unclear. So that was the reaction by just issuing, releasing less information to the market. Okay. Uh, here that's uh, the last uh, reference to some empirical papers in accounting because that's, and that's going to be the most relevant at least to the main part of this talk. Uh, Sen Tuck, a review of accounting studies uh, they find that firms accelerate this warning responses 
uh, the warning is in response to peer firm's warning. Okay, so when I'm in an industry and my uh, the other firms issued some profit warning, I decide now suddenly I can release some information. Okay, so <coughs> that's the story. Uh, and consistent with this, Eva Sletten, Review of Accounting Studies 2012, I provide evidence that managers withhold bad information that exogenous price, stock price declines can induce its disclosure. So it's again, information, it's not that the, necessarily that the future was less clear when things were bad, but managers were withholding this information and some exogenous pressure triggered the firm to <coughs> disclose this information. Okay, so, uh, yeah. The, the information being uh, uh, disclosed here, is, is, is this all hard information uh, that can be verified in one way or another? And what, what prevents me as a manager from <coughs> saying that I, I, pre I predict the future will be rosy, but this is so vague so I would treat it that the information is, and you can see like in our model, it's going to be verifiable. So in a sense, it's not, I mean, if you're just going to say some cheap talk statement, I see a great future for this company as many other, virtually all CEOs say, say about their companies. So Nobody, not, not yeah, so for you to have some meaningful information, it has to be verifiable or that it verifiable now, or if it's not verifiable, it can be checked in the future whether or not you're relying and you can be taken to court. Yeah. I, I think uh, just the words you know, are it's, it's a question of information and assert, asserting something. A firm sees something is going wrong. Mm -hmm. People come in with an announcement and try to understand what is it. Because they want to come with some announcement to explain why things are not going on, to understand for themselves. And, but then when they see other firms coming with peers, coming with that announcement, they understand that it's an issue of the market. And then they feel more comfortable to come with this announcement. So they feel more comfortable because now they're more confident that the information is correct? Or the no, no they, 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 find, <coughs> they find to themselves faster the explanation why the business is going badly because they understand now that the main issue is the market. Okay, so that's exactly. So I'd like you to have this intuition that it's not it's not your problem it's someone it's not it's your fault that things go bad it's you know market general market condition okay perfect okay and we didn't so this is i'm going to start talk mostly about a paper that i had with peter demars of ural acharya we are not empiricists or don't run these regressions or anything but at the time ural took some disclosure data from banks during the uh, this crisis, 2007-2008, and it's not clear here, but we, we, maybe I should have like the table, but at least from the look at it, we, it seems that we saw also that what, what Slayton was talking about before, and that St. Tucker were talking about before, we saw also among banks that, you know, my banks issued mortgages that didn't perform so well, but Citibank, maybe because of they had to release an earning announcement, they had to disclose that things were going really badly in the market. And now all the other banks, or my bank, now seems more comfortable of saying, you know, also our portfolio is, not, is doing pretty badly. It's not maybe catastrophic. It's not maybe as catastrophic Citibank, but it also have to admit, have to really tell you that it's not doing that well. And, you know, it's market condition. It's, you know, even Citibank is, uh, it's not me, it's the market. So what are you supposed to the see here? On the left is for both the numbers. Again? So, no. There are no million banks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it's in billions. So it's billions. It's in billions for losses, and it's a number of banks for the for the blue lines. Yeah. I think. Sorry, can you show it again? Wrong direction. Wrong direction. I mean, what are you supposed to see? That big big losses. I don't see the big losses. No, no. I'm just saying that if you look at the data, I don't have it. I call it. 
correlation between those two? I don't see it. No, no, I, it's not a correlation. Just saying that there is, if you look at the data, and it's not clear here, I agree with you, it's not clear here. I need really to give you the release dates and which bank released what and what was mandatory, what was voluntary. If you look at this data and you see, which is not so clear from this graph here, you also have a suspicion of some clustering going on, that some banks, uh, maybe we felt some bad information and feel more comfortable of releasing this bad information when some other banks release this bad information. What? Maybe similar portfolios, but we don't see these warnings. We don't see. It's mostly on the positive, on the negative side. Maybe on the negative side we see like this higher correlation, and in the positive side we don't see. Uh, we see these events. Okay. So now it's a voluntary disclosures or the mandatory? Again. So these are these a picture before it was voluntary and mandatory combined. Okay. Okay. So let me just focus on what I want us to take from all these quotes is uh, what we get because the starting point is that firms need to reveal some information on a mandatory basis okay but still they have a great deal of flexibility of the level of detail they provide and also some other announcements that they can reveal. So they can be more forthcoming in terms of information we provide and can be more opaque. And they have a lot of flexibility on how they do it. And it's going to be very, in principle, firms are required to provide, to disclose information, material information in a timely manner. But it's going to be virtually impossible for someone to take a firm to court and tell them, you know, or with the exception maybe of Marilyn, he knows what he, uh, why I, I mentioned his name, but it's going to be very difficult still to take a firm to court and tell them, you know, you had this piece of information before and you didn't disclose this information because the firm can always say we're not 100% sure, we had to do checking, we want to verify these numbers were correct and so on. So. Uh, firms enjoy a great deal of flexibility when it comes to uh, releasing information. Okay, so what I'm going to do uh, in the next uh, hour or so is talk about disclosure models. And it's all going to be about how you can be strategic in terms of what information you're going to disclose. Okay, so the main ingredients uh, of the model are that an agent or manager may learn a piece of information. The agent never lies, okay, but he tells the truth but not the entire truth, okay, the whole truth. So he can be strategic regarding what and when to disclose, okay. Market is not fooled by the, uh, invest the agent decision or the manager decision, so you account for this effect. And he needs to draw his own conclusion from the, mar the manager being quiet. Okay, so let me first describe a, a first version of the mole. A manager knows a type of a value, S is some number. There is a common prior regarding S. The only decision in this mole is whether or not to disclose this piece of information. And the manager payoff is upon disclosure, if you reveal that his value is S, he's going to get S. Okay. If he's going to get, if he's keeping quiet, he's going to get a non-disclosure reward, which is the expected value of S conditional of the manager being quiet in equilibrium. Okay. So... What I want you to focus on is the fact that the manager knows, and this is, I should, I should have emphasized that this is common knowledge. The market knows that the manager knows. Okay. Uh, okay. The fact that he knows is common knowledge, not what he knows is common knowledge. Yeah, the fact that he knows is common knowledge, not what exactly he knows. Okay. So, uh, let's try to figure out. If the price, if the distribution of types is uniform on 0, 100. And let's make the plausible assumption, and one can convince himself that this is true, that the manager is going to focus, is going to following 
a threshold strategy, what would you conclude, or what would be the no disclosure price, assuming that the threshold for disclosure is 50? So all types above 50 and above disclose. So if you're 60, you disclose and you get 60. And if you're 40 below 50, you keep quiet. So you see that the manager was quiet. What is going to be? 25. Okay, so that's clear, was 25. And you can see that in equilibrium, the conclusion of this is that in equilibrium, all types would reveal the re information. Except maybe for the last. So again. I didn't get the 20. So types to manager decides whether not to disclose or not to disclose. If you're above 50, you're 60, you disclose and you get 60. If you're 50 or below, you keep quiet. And now the question is, what is going to be the reward for a non-disclosing type, assuming that that's the strategy that he follows? So if he doesn't disclose, we conclude that he's anywhere between 0 and 50. Uniform average of 25. The conclusion would be pretty immediate is that the only equilibrium that is not going to be any strategic disclosure because all types are going to disclose their information, except maybe the lowest type, but for him it's irrelevant. Is it paper said he grows within the co author? Very early paper to make exactly Yeah, yeah, so I'm going to. Milgram. Milgram and Grossman. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll put their name. I'll put. I'll, I'll, yeah, so I'll put the names, uh, yeah. So this is, this is just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Why is this a unique equilibrium? 50 cannot be an equilibrium because the type 50 is a threshold type. He's better than the average type who's not disclosing because he's getting only 25, the average type who's not disclosing, but his value is 50. So it's better for him to say that he's 50 and uh, get his payoff. So that's the classic unraveling argument goes back to as far as I know, Grossman 81, Milgram 81, pretty much the same time. 40 would disclose, but it's better than 25. That's what we need to say. easier than marginal type so. Okay. So all type disclosed with certainty. First is you have to convince yourself that agents in equilibrium must follow a threshold strategy. And second, that the threshold must be trivial. So that's the conclusion is that all types uh, disclose their value with certainty. Okay. The reason why agents follow a threshold strategy is because the incentive to disclose are increasing in type. The payoff upon non-disclosure is the same. The payoff upon disclosure is increasing in type. So the incentive do increase with type. Okay, let me try a second version. And I took it from the paper with Viral and, uh, and Peter, but it's uh, actually this version fits an earlier paper, and here is the version. So now instead of the manager learns his type S, the manager may learn his type S. So it's not common knowledge what he knows. Okay. So the manager S learns S with probability P. See there is a common prior about S as before. For the, the second part of the talk, uh, in some cases, we're going to assume that uh, uh, the prior distribution is that it's normal, normally distributed. But everything else is the same. Upon, uh, so managers decide whether or not to disclose their type. Uh, upon disclosure, you get S. Upon non-disclosure, you get what do we think about you, condition on you being quiet. Yeah, no, I, I did mention it. Well, with Sergio, I have to stop. So managers, what I mean that managers may learn his type S, it means that with probability P, the, ma the manager learns the signal S, his value S. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, let's run some simple examples. As before, types are uniform between 0 and 100. Okay, And let's make things simple. Uh, the, f the probability that the manager learned his type is 0.5. So P equals 0.5. So 
Suppose that the threshold for disclosure is 50. Okay. Now, what would you conclude should be the reward for a manager who is not disclosing? Okay. So now you think to yourself, well, the manager may be innocent because only for ability 50%, he doesn't, he, only for ability 50%, he learns his type. So with probability 50%, he doesn't learn his type. And in this case, his type is uniform between 0 and 100. And in this case, the, re the proper reward for him should be 50. Or this guy is actually, uh, knows his type and kept quiet. If he kept quiet following this threshold strategy, his reward should be? 25, okay, so it should be, what happened? Probably right, okay. So it's, there are two events that we can consider. One gives us 50, the other gives us 25. And the reward should be some combination of the two. Right, so here I'll give you three alternatives to pick a couple of alternatives to pick. 25, uh, clearly that's not going to work because there is a possibility that should give him 50. The other two alternatives I should give you is 37.5 and 41.66. So do you have, uh, what would you say? C, 41.66. So first, why not B? Perfect. Yeah, perfect. So, remind your name? Patrick. Patrick. Okay, so Patrick gave the, the exact log. So let me just repeat it. 37.5 that if you were put weight 50 50, and that makes sense, you know, because you say, well, probability 50% he learns. But then you take a uh, few minutes and for Patrick to a few seconds to realize that, you know, if he didn't disclose the probability that he the probability that he doesn't know is no longer 50%. It went up. Okay. Originally, it was 50%, but because in many cases, people who had the information disclose, conditional no disclosures, the probability is not 50-50. The probability is actually two-thirds and a third. And that gives you the 41.66. Okay. Uh, now... I won't solve this small or this example, but I'll just state uh, what the result is. The result is that now we're going to have a non-trivial disclosure strategy. Okay, and the economic intuition behind is quite obvious. Not disclosing, you're not going to be pulled with all the type who are strategic who are not disclosing. You also being being pulled with types who are innocent, who are people who really don't have the information. And that increases the payoff upon non-disclosure and now leads the scope of non-trivial threshold strategy. Okay, so uh, just giving you to the literature. Uh, the first unraveling, the, the first version of the model that I described was Milgram 81, Grossman 81, uh, pretty much the same time as that could tell, and maybe people even said it before about this unraveling, I don't know, but uh, when I give credit, I give to both of them that they were the first one who came up with this argument. The fact that with uncertainty regarding the nature of information that the manager has, you may have non-trivial facial strategies, a strategic disclosure information, it was first pointing out pointed out by a paper by Ron Dyle in 1985, and second by a paper by Jung and Kwon in 1988. Okay, now what I should mention here, first both papers in accounting as well as, you know, all, as you pointed out, most of the empirical literature in, on this topic is in accounting, so I guess 
part of the subtext of my talk here is that there are interesting things to learn in accounting, even though that it looks a bit surprising, both on the theory side and the empirical side. Okay. The other, this is just an anecdote. Dai wrote this model, but his number was actually half and half, or 37.5. So the expression that he had was 37.5. So he made the claim using the wrong, ex he made the right claim using the wrong expression. A Jung Kwon is a paper that correct it, makes the right claim with the right expression, it was the 41.66. Uh, so the conclusion of Jung and Kwon is the existence of such non-trivial equilibrium. So that's the main result in this. Uh, okay, now how would an equilibrium would look like? We'll get into this, okay? In the paper, June and Kwon, they don't argue for uniqueness. But we'll argue, we'll, we'll add this. Okay, so solving for the equilibrium, how it looks like in a more general expression, not just example. Uh, su suppose that the threshold for disclosure is X. Uh, the payoff for non-disclosure is what I said before, the expected type condition of non-disclosure and the fact that the equilibrium strategy is x, and an equilibrium is a fixed point where h of x star equal to x star, okay? And the expression looks a bit ugly, h of x, the conditional value, the expected value conditional or no disclosure, you have to condition two events. Um, suppose that he learns his type and was strategic in hiding his type. And I think as Patrick said, we also have to account that there are fewer types at this point because some of them are already disclosing. Combined with the type who are innocent, really didn't have anything to disclose. So that's the mass of my minus p. You have to divide it and you have to take the fixed point of this expression. Okay, and Julian Kwon uh, proved existence and Eric asked about uniqueness. In the Julian Kwon, there was no... So my so I have I have still like 40 minutes or 50 minutes left. So let me start with the static and move to the dynamic. Okay, but first I need to get the basic correctly. Okay, so. Uh, as I said, I'm going to focus more on the paper with Viral Acharya and Peter De Marzo. And our motivation was mostly on this clustering effect. Can you have a case where, uh, can you rationalize this clustering effect that when you have exogenous information coming out, negative exogenous information coming out, it induces more disclosure on your part? Uh, Are you going to answer the uniqueness? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And we do discuss some possible asset pricing implication, but you can see that there are some, cave I mean, there is a wedge between what we do in the mall and what actually, what you think that is needed. So the reason I'm pointing it out is that you're here and you may or may not find it interesting, but if you do find it interesting, I'll point to something that we like to know in dynamic modes, but still there is work to be done. Okay, now first, when you approach this problem, it seems that the intuition is quite clear. Why there is more disclosure of information when things look bad? Suppose you have some information which is not so great, some mediocre, okay? which is mediocre. So you get, I don't know, uh, a B, it's not an A, but it's not a C, so it's a mediocre grade. If the, external, the, exogenous, the exogenous signal says, well, you know, on average, the market is C, now B, the mediocre signal, look quite good. So you'll release it, okay? But if the exogenous information is, you know, that the average is A, it's very close to A, 
you'd say, you know, B in comparison look pretty bad. Maybe I should be quiet and people will give me the credit that maybe I didn't have anything to disclose so they'll, I'll get something which closer to A and I'm going to benefit from being quiet. So the intuition seems clear. So I'll try somehow in the next 45 minutes to convince you that this intuition is wrong. But the, co the, the, expre it's like the expression is wrong, but the result is correct. That the intuition is wrong, but the result is correct. But it has to come from something else. Okay. But first, I think we'll have to, Eric was pushing me all the time about uniqueness. And this is how we prove this. So uh, first, we're going to examine the proof of uniqueness, how we, how we describe the equilibrium. So I'm going to describe you some properties of the static equilibrium. And then I'm going to describe a dynamic model that I'm going to argue that it's necessary to rationalize this effect of clustering of bad information. And I'll focus more on the first version of the dynamic model. And maybe we're going to discuss later a second version of the dynamic model. OK, so let's go back to this slide here. Just to remind everyone, we talk about the static model that has this feature. Uh, Manager learns this information, we, and we learn this information of ability P, and, uh, and that's basically it, and everything else is what I described before. Now, I would argue that the equilibrium is unique for the following reason. Okay. Not only that there is a threshold for, uh, there, is a, there is an equilibrium, uh, fixed point h of x star equals to x star but it's actually the minimum of h of x across all x's okay the second result is going to be about why this intuition that we had before about the b grade the c grade and the a grades why this is incorrect okay uh, okay, so let me so first let me show you uh, let me argue why this proves uniqueness. Okay, h of x. Let us just recall h of x. H of x, or didn't I have it? Didn't have it. So that's my fault. So h of x, I had. But let me so write what h of x is. H of x is expected type assuming strategy x. Meaning that the threshold strategy x, meaning that you follow a threshold strategy of, of x. Except non-disclosing type. Except non-disclosing non type. So, for example, the example that we just mentioned, that with probability 50%, you learn your type, and the threshold for disclosure is 50, we concluded that h of 50 equals to 41.6. Okay? This, uh, thir no, no 37.5, 41.6. No, no, that was a half-half, that was a long one. If x is 50, then it's 41.6. So we, h of 50, believe me, we showed that h of 50 is 41.6. This is not an equilibrium outcome because 50 is different from 41.6. Now, the, there's going to be h of x star equal x star, and x star is going to be smaller than 41.6 because that's going to minimize that h of x. Now, Let's try to think of ourselves. What is h of 0? h of 0 is a uh, the, what do we assume about non-disclosing type, assuming that the disclosure threshold is 0, meaning that everybody is disclosing. If everybody is disclosing, everybody who can discloses, what do you conclude about someone who does not disclose? He, he must have not known. So the h of 0 is 50. 
what is uh, so let's just listen h of 0 is 50 <laughs> what is h of 100 suppose h of 100 that means that nobody discloses so again it's 50 because if you if you keep quiet, either when or not you inform or don't inform, or you inform or not inform, we don't learn anything about you. Okay, so uh, h of zero equals to h of a hundred, and that equals fifty. So first thing, just to realize, h is a non-monotone function. In general, we'd expect h of x to be lower than fifty, right? H of fifty was forty-one point six, and in general, we have the intuition that if you keep quiet, that has some negative signal about you. Okay, but at the two extreme you get to the unconditional mean. So it must be uh, uh, non-monotone. Okay. And the fact that the, the f any fixed point must be at the minimum of H, that immediately implies that the, f the equilibrium is unique. Existence of an equilibrium just follows from, you know, that looking at the two extreme in the intermediate value theorem must be a, some crossing point. Uniqueness follows from the fact that it crosses at the minimum. We all agree to this, that the minimum implies uniqueness. Okay, so we're left with just convincing ourselves that this is at the minimum. Okay. Okay, let's try to think about the structure of the equilibrium. Okay, so here, brown here, that's a set of types who are uninformed and of course keep quiet. And the yellow types are the set of agents who are informed and decide to keep quiet. Okay. And the H is the average type between the blue and the yellow. But, uh, sorry, the brown and the yellow. Yeah, I'm, or I'm colorblind, but not to this extent. So brown and yellow. <laughs> Okay, so why is this at the minimum? Okay, let's try to raise this threshold a little bit higher. Okay, so we push the threshold for disclosure a bit higher, from X star to something which is a bit higher. Do we make the average type to be better or worse? Let's try to think. The average between here and here was X star. We injected this slice of agents who are between X star and X. Okay, these are better than average types. And if we I inject into a set a better than average types, I only improve the average. Okay, so if I push it in this direction, the average goes up. Okay. So my worry is that what would happen if I push it down? Because if I push it down, maybe the opposite would happen and uh, uh, the average would go down. But no. If I push the threshold down, what do I do? I exclude from this set a set of agents who are below average. Right? I exclude from this set agents between X and X star. So if I exclude agents who are below average, it's also improving the average type in the set. Okay, so no matter how you move, starting from a fixed point, you increase the average type. Okay, so I don't know. I like this argument. We didn't need to do its work for any distribution and we didn't need to do the algebra. And it proves uniqueness and Okay. Okay, now let's try to argue that the intuition about the A, B, and C is not really convincing. Okay. Uh, and for this, I'll rely on the normal distribution. So it's not going to be a general claim, but here is what I'm going to focus on. We consider a normal distribution. And we say like the following, suppose that uh, a priori before an external information came out, 
the part of belief about your type that it was uniform, uh, normally distributed with some mean and some, and some variance. And following an external signal, and let's assume that the external signal is going to be following a drawn normal distribution, the posterior belief is going to be, uh, is going to be a distribution, let's say, with a signal, uh, either it's going to be Ah, sorry. Either it's going to be a normal distribution with a mean of 1, the variance of 1, or a normal distribution with a mean of minus 1 and the variance of 1. With a joint normal distribution, the, exposed, the posterior variance is unaffected by uh, the external signal. So let's just remind us of what it means. You started with some general mu and sigma. Now you have some external information coming out. Okay. And following this external information, if it was positive, the belief about the type was that it has a mean of 1. If it was a negative signal, the belief is that the mean is minus 1. Okay. Two cases. In which case we would have more disclosure. So in each case, we play the game that I described before, right? So there is some belief probability P, the manager is informed, we calculate the threshold and so on. The question is in which event we would have more, a higher probability of disclosure. Now, let me tell you, here the threshold for disclosure is going to be lower. Because we start with a lower distribution. Instead of starting with a distribution like 0 to 100, I start with a distribution that say it's between minus 50 and 50. So it's a lower distribution. So the threshold for disclosure is going to be lower. Those two numbers are just two, two different priors that you consider. This, are, this is the prior. Let me just. Cases of mu and sigma, that's what you mean. This is a prior, and this is two possible posteriors. After the external signal has been realized. After non no, no. Before we go into the disclosure game, some some external information coming out. Okay. Okay. Now the threshold for disclosure, when we believe that things go well, the threshold for disclosure is higher compared to here. Right? We can conclude it even in the previous example where they had the uniform distribution between zero and hundred. The threshold for disclosure is the power distribution, it's not uniform between 0 and 100, it's between 100 and 200 is higher. Okay. But that's not the question that we're asking. The question that we're asking is what is the probability of disclosure? I argue the probability of disclosure is exactly the same. The probability of disclosure in a mold that starts with a uniform between 0 and 100 is the same probability of disclosure when you have the power distribution it's between 100 and 200. And it's actually the same, the same probability of disclosure if the power distribution is uniform between 0 and 200. It doesn't matter. True, the threshold for disclosure changes, but the probability of mass of agents who are going to disclose it is exactly the same. Right? And the easiest way of saying it is change the, p the reward of the agent. Before that, for simplicity, assume that his reward is S. Say that I pay him S plus a constant. It doesn't change anything. So S plus a constant if he reveals his type, and the expected value of S plus a constant if he doesn't disclose his type. The constant has no, no effect on the disclosure decision. Okay, that this is the effect here. But actually it's even stronger. Instead of S, we can pay him twice as much 2 times s, so 2 times s if he discloses, and 2 times the expected value of s conditional non-disclosure if he doesn't disclose, still the mole is completely isomorphic. It doesn't have any, it has any, any bite. Yeah, so the, so the conclusion is that the numbers will change, but uh, no, the probability of disclosure is going to be unaffected. Okay. So I hope that by now we know that uh, 
the existing n uniqueness in a static mole. We know that we don't need algebra to prove it. And the fact that a static mole in it itself, by just comparing the prior distribution, cannot generate an effect of clustering. Okay. In a normal way, but also in a uniform, there are like uh, uh, a bunch of cases as long as I can play this trick here of like affine transformation that applies for normal, applies for uniform, applies from there. Okay. Uh, okay, so to generate the effect of clustering disclosure, we have to push it more in the direction that Guru wanted, that now we, ha we need to consider a dynamic mode. Okay, so the dynamic disclosure game is uh, the probability of being informed is increasing over time. Okay. Um, no, it's, yeah, but st still in the direction, in the direction, <laughs> in the direction. We still have more slides to go, but in the direction, still. <laughs> more than one. Uh, the probability of disclosure is increasing over time. The manager maximizes the, you can think about the reward being equal to the stock price. So he, he maximizes some weighted average of the, of the stock prices across time. The stock price is the expected value of, the, of his type conditional on available information. If he disclose his information, that, then what is written here is S. If it's, uh, he didn't disclose that the expected value of S conditional no disclosure. Okay. Um, we don't care about lambda T, what expression form it doesn't matter. Uh, our question is how an external signal would affect the firm strategy. Okay. So we're going to have uh, an external signal which is Y. And I know that Sergio really likes it, so I'm going to follow a, a joint normal distribution. S is normal and Y is, uh, follow is also normal and they follow a joint normal distribution. And we're going to assume that it has some positive correlation with S. Okay, so think about it. I am a bank. S is the value of my asset. And Y is some signal that is going to be revealed maybe by other banks or maybe by the central bank or whatever. Talking about the state of the industry and it's going to be positively correlated with my signal. Okay, now the first version of the mode that generates this result is the simplest one that P doesn't increase over time because that's going to be sufficient to generate the clustering effect. Later on we can ask ourselves what would happen if um, uh, if P is increasing over time. The reason why, assuming that P of T is fixed, P of T is P throughout time, is that the model is going to collapse to a two-period model. Okay. Either you're going to disclose before the external information coming out or after it comes out. Okay. If you decide that it's not in your best interest to disclose before the external information is being released, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to disclose a day before, okay? So this mold really collapses to a two-period mold. Dynamic, but a two-period mold, okay? So and just, sorry, uh, Sagan, you, are on, you, you get information about S? In the sure? beginning. For mm. sure, at the beginning. You know you're on you know No, it not for sure, but you, either you get it or you don't get it in the beginning. So that's a P. That's P. A P. P. And the public news for sure is going to be announced, but you don't know when. You know when, so oh, you know it's when. It's even deterministic. Yeah. Even deterministic. Okay. In this version it is, and I said that this is equivalent to a two-period model. But you do not know the value of y. No, you, you don't. Have, if you know s, you have some, some distribution. Sure, you, you have or some. You have, I mean, you have some belief on that. That's you have some belief. Okay. Everybody has a belief. You're entitled to your own belief about okay. y. You and probably and have a better be, belief. And, and, and since those are correct, if I know s, then I, then I update my belief. If you know math, yeah, that's what you're going to do. So you're going to okay. update. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So again? It's going to be announced tomorrow what the game is being announced today. So again? It's going to be announced tomorrow. Why should I shut up today? What's the, what is, 
So, right, so we said that we said before that your payoff is the average payoff, average stock price across time. Okay, so you're sensitive. So you're sensitive to information to the to the stock price now. Okay. Okay. So. So here, as I said before, this is like a really a two-period model, okay? And think about the red line is going to be what is going to be the threshold for disclosure in a static model that starts with a, with a posterior that follows a signal or external signalization of Y1. Here is the blue line that uh, uh, the threshold disclosure in a static model where the, the beliefs is a posterior following a more negative value of y. So this is like the red and the blue. So that would be uh, in a one period mode, how you would behave. Now, you can ask yourself, what would be like the static equilibrium, is the equilibrium in a static mode where we just have the prior? Then this is given by this x star of p. Now, of course, this is not an equilibrium because this was based just on two myopic behaviors and we're interested in, for example, what is going to be the non-myopic effect here in period one, in the first period where he knows, you know, that some information is going to be revealed in the future. But actually, I think the argument of clustering even does not, w goes, I mean, it's clearer than that. I mean, it's, it goes on even with, uh, with agents just following a myopic myopic strategies. But let's nevertheless uh, talk about the non-myopic behavior. What is the effect is here? Is this still equivalent to writing a put? I know I'm good. I can write a put and never, if you never get it, I thought it's going to collect the data. Is that uh, a Is that a different dimension? Probably, but it's hard for me to do the connection here, so online. So I, let's defer the question for like half an hour and I'll, I'll happy to think about it during the break. Um, okay, so this was assuming myopic behavior here and here. And as I said before, the argument of why you have clustering following negative information in the dynamic model, it's true even if firms would follow a myopic strategy. Why even in a, if firms would follow a myopic strategy, we would have the negative clustering effect? For the following reason, suppose that the firm was following a myopic strategy, this green, blue, and red, okay? Think about a firm here, which is higher than X star. It reveals information already in the first period, okay? So true, in the second period, the threshold for disclosure as I say, it's either the blue or the red, okay? But here, notice here, the threshold here is irrelevant because if this information is here and is wants to disclose it here, it doesn't matter because you already disclosed in the first period, okay? So, uh, uh, and following a negative, if it's like the external, external signal is negative, the threshold for disclosure is here, the blue, and now there is a scope for disclosure because all the time between the green and the blue could disclose in the second period. So even the myopic behavior, wrong expression, correct result, even the, with myopic behavior, we're gonna get like the correct effect that we're gonna have clustering of announcement following the release of negative public information. Okay. Um, No information. I mean, the would say there will be no revelation of information for good, good news. You get both sides. Yeah. I wanted to ask you again what Gore asked. So you thinking of this as being like the manager has some kind of stock options or, or some stocks that he owns and he can sell them over time? Is that what you're thinking about? That he cares about the average price? When you say reward depends on the average price of the stock over the 
Yeah, so it has there, so, yeah, we can think about, I guess, like different. So he's selling his stock over time or ex implicitly, implicitly his benefit, like. He's getting an option every day at the strike price equal the current day price. Or, I don't know, these outside opportunities. So the way I view or it the is, is so this, yeah. So it, this is just like a you could, the way I view it is like a reduced form. You know, when a manager who's uh, who's managing a firm who seems to be successful, part of the success is attributed to him. And in the labor market, he's more likely to generate like a higher payoff. So. No matter what, so what I assume obviously is that he cares. The stock price, the problem with that is that the stock price becomes more informative, right? It cannot become less informative, right? Because you're giving more information. Yeah. Which makes it, I think, more likely that it is because he's selling stock than because uh, people are rewarding him according to past prices as opposed to today's price. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we can. Go, a different interpretation, everything works for me, as long as he's, he cares about, he yeah. doesn't just care about the terminal stock price, and but here yeah. there is a terminal yeah. stock, he also cares also about intermediate stock price. Maybe because investor cares also about intermediate stock price, so they implicitly in the contract, they reward the manager for the possibility that they're going to sell the stock, so they, they are sensitive to the intermediate stock price, or any other stories that we can think about. Anyway, going back to here, so I hope that you're convinced that here that will generate this effect that following negative information announcement, there's going to be a more scope for information relief, uh, for information revelation. And the intuition is kind of, I like it in saying that, you know, in good times, is in good times, firms on average have good information, and they feel more comfortable of being transparent, right? So we saw like the Greg Miller story that, you know, when things are good, you're more transparent and you, you know, you don't have any, you feel very comfortable of telling many stories about what's going on in the firm, okay? So when an information, say when the central bank or someone else is releasing some external information, there is not much that you can add. Because you already said a lot before, so you were, because you were very transparent before. So the scope of new information that would come from you in this event would be pretty low. But in bad times, you're sitting on negative information. Now you're being more reluctant of revealing this information. Okay. The external signal is being revealed. Now there is a scope you're hiding this information. So now there is a scope for you to reveal this information. Okay, so going back to the normal distribution, so what we generate in some sense is two prior, two posterior distribution in the second period, but it's not just, you know, following an external signal, but it also embedded the strategic disclosure decision in the first period, okay? And that wouldn't be a simple linear transformation that will cancel out any disclosure effect. Now, if we want to disclose them all, I have also to talk about the non, the non myopic effects. So what would you guess what will happen here? The threshold for disclosure in the first period should be higher or lower in the first period if you account for non myopic effects. So this was the green, blue, and red was all based on myopic behavior. So for the second period, clearly is myopic, so that was not the question. But in the first period, this really has a bite. So I argue that the facial full disclosure should go higher, right? Because it's not sufficient for you to disclose now some information because it increases your stock price by one dollar. You also think about that you exercise an option. When you reveal this information, you cannot take it back. So you may regret the fact that I was transparent now and didn't reveal such great information. It still increased my price by $1. And I regret the fact because in the future, some great news coming out, ex great external news coming out. And if I only been quiet, kept quiet, I could enjoy 
the real high prices, but I cannot enjoy it anymore if I disclose. So the uh, threshold for disclosure is going up, and you can talk about, uh, you know, what will be the values, and if you know the graph, I mean, Peter is pretty good in drawing this graphic, so his things are moving on this side, but that's more or less uh, the effect. Yeah, so here we didn't have this effect because P was constant, but you can think about P is increasing over time. And if I have good, so in good times, firms typically get good information, good results, okay? And they're very, they're tempted to reveal it as a, the minute they learn this information, okay? So once uh, external information coming out, there is, I mean, the market was transparent to begin with the firms were transparent to begin with, there is not much that the firm can add at this point. Yes, there is some scope when P of T is increasing over time, but there is much less than compared to the case where in bad times, on average, the information was bad, and that's, there is much more things to say. So we just different level of transparency is different times. Okay, so anyway, so that's the main... Uh, Keep that, I think that's more than it's here. Uh, when P of T, we said, increases over time, we also have other effects. Just before the release of the external information, there is no point on disclosing because uh, the benefit, the, the, the option price is really, I mean, it's does, it, exercising the option and disclosing is completely, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to disclose some information a day before an external information are coming out. So you have some blackouts, but more or less the same effect. Is there any data that could potentially embarrass your theory? Is there any data? The problem is, I mean, I, the data is a slate in the same Tucker papers that I referenced before. So, for example, so the Zen Tucker paper, all that, uh, the papers that I mentioned in the first five minutes were about these accounting data that, accounting studies that shows that firms are, are revealing more information following some bad news, external bad news. So, if you have like an, uh, if you show that the, this empirical data is wrong, the conclusion is wrong, that of course would go against this theory. You can say that, you know, I built this theory knowing one of the paper we knew before the other paper came out after we wrote the first version of the paper, but uh, it's true that we knew some of the empirical patterns to begin with. I can tell you what sort of like the empirical patterns that we tried to push for, and still that this, this specific model is not, is not yet good enough for this, and, you know, whether or not this is the right avenue for this, I don't know. Uh, but in terms of, you know, uh, now it's a little bit tricky to say because the only thing I can say, if, you can, if we can show, convince ourselves that the empirical findings in the accounting literature were for local or wrong conclusion, that would go and say that that uh, evidence against this theory here. Right. Have you tried to compare this uh, statistics of the behavior in the quotas when the stock options are being awarded compared to other data? 
So for the stock option paper, as, so my paper is more about the Tsen-Tucker effect, about the clustering bad information. So it's really not about uh, Abudi and Kaznik. Yeah, but they do, but they do look at the stock, before the stock price performance, which is not 100% consistent with efficient market. I guess it's not, maybe it is, I don't know, it's hard, hard to think about it. But you have some different performance leading to the award of the uh, option prices and after. But nevertheless, I mean, this is this is a bit orthogonal to what we uh, what we're doing here. I mean, in the same in the same framework of being strategic of when to disclose information, but uh, different effect. As a true theorist, uh, empirical. Logic is compelling without The fact yeah. that you, you, this is a consideration you should have in mind is compelling the fact that No, the fact that CEOs yeah, understand yeah. that, yeah. that's, that's uh, yeah. what the yeah. data may yeah. say. Yeah. What does it say? Yeah. 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 Ken, Ken. I'm trying to say, yeah, it's compelling. He might not have had empirical evidence because there might be other factors playing in. I think physicists have a different view of life, but uh, <laughs> uh, so I think this is, I think more or less what I wanted to, uh, the main results that I wanted to convey, the remaining 10 minutes or so, maybe I can talk more about some other papers that I've been working on with some people here and some other co-authors. Some go maybe into directions that Gould was referring about dynamic models. Some talk about some other aspects. Uh, and maybe also talk about some empirical uh, patterns that I find like intriguing, may or may not be related to this, but I found like interesting at least at the time Peter and I thought that it's interesting to think about. Uh, so the first paper in random order, not uh, this, the paper with Sergio Hart and Moti Pierre, we, still interested in all these disclosure games but in a more in a richer framework you can think about uh, a manager or an agent has different pieces of information and it's a static mole and you have different pieces of information that the decision is what to disclose uh, in this type of environment and the comparison is to a case where the market or the receiver the listener uh, that the terminology is committing to some reward policy. So this is like a mechanism design question, whether or not the outcome of uh, disclosure games, how does they compare to a mechanism design where the listener tries to convince uh, uh, or try to get the agent to talk as much as possible. And the main conclusion is that there is no difference between the two. The outcome of the disclosure games uh, coincide with the outcome of uh, mechanism design problem. Okay. Uh, another paper, Andy from the previous paper, and Peter is still my ongoing co-author. So we are interested in the manager actually producing some information. Okay, so the question here is, uh, the manager can produce this piece of evidence and what is the incentive to produce this piece of evidence and, uh, and what uh, game would he play? So that's second version. Uh, st still it's a static mold so it doesn't address I guess like a comment about dynamic mold. Here is a dynamic mold which is richer than the first mold and it's, uh, it's a toy mold. Uh, but it's, it took quite some time to figure out what happened, uh, what happened in this type of environment. It seems like a natural extension where instead of one piece of information, you have multiple pieces of information. The term is just two pieces of information, two periods, okay? So I have a value, V, 
and about which I can learn possibly two pieces of information, maybe zero, maybe one, maybe two. So I may learn a signal S about V in period one or two. I may learn a second signal about V either in period one and period two. So there is no time relation between the two signals. So what's interesting in this model because it, is that it highlights one effect, which is you may have in the second period, you may have the same amount of information, but the information was disclosed in a different period of time. So think about the case where only you're in the second period and only one signal is being revealed. And the one signal being revealed might have been revealed in the first period or in the second period. So the same information, but it was revealed in a different, on a different date. Right? Our intuition was, well, the market is going to be rewarding the agent whose the signal was revealed earlier. And this it was more transparent. But actually, when you work out like the, all the details, the equilibrium outcome is that the market generates higher value for information that was provided like in a more, was more recent. It's a toy version model only for this. But uh, to be honest, I mean, we tried. It's not that we didn't try to extend it to more periods and more signal. It just, this was complicated enough at the time for our ability, so, uh, so we stopped there. Uh, Can we go back to the, to the costly information uh, acquisition for This was not costly, not necessarily. Uh, yeah, so in one version it was, the first version and the first model was not costly. Yes, we have a version with a cost. In the, in the models we've seen so far, the, the social value of information, there is no social value of information, right? There's no allocation. There are no allocation implications. So, so, so any, any, any model which forces you or induces you to create information is actually wasteful. Right. So in this, I didn't have the time. In this model, we also embed it when into a setup where actually the information is being revealed will have some efficiency implication, will have some allocation uh, implications. Uh, Okay, so that's like a dynamic mold, a paper here with Amnon and Andy, who's still at Stanford. Uh, I'm interested in the dynamic mold, so the value is not, is not fixed, but it's just following a random walk. Okay, so the, we like to think about in finance that the value follows some random walk. Okay. Uh, so the version of the model is that in each, uh, at each point in time, the manager may or may not have a piece of evidence to show what the value is. Okay, and so in principle, the values, the value follows a random walk, but the market just sees what the values that the manager discloses. Okay, and the question is. How, you know, how would he deviate from a static disclosure strategy? What's the observed patterns of stock prices that we're going to see here? Uh, in, uh, in such an environment that, at least in my view, resembles more, uh, more like the real life where you know, values are not fixed and there is new information coming out, even to the firm at... Uh, in every period or potentially in every period and this game is uh, fully dynamic so we have some results some characterization still as we say work in progress we have some all the other papers are published this paper is uh, things are uh, not uh, still work in progress uh, other courses I'm just going through like a list of papers about how would an external information analyst would how would he affect uh, Disclosure by the firm, um, crowding in effect, crowding in effect, what is going to be effect on the overall information. So let me skip that. And here is some empirical pattern. I said, you know, in the last minute, I'm just going to point to some empirical patterns that I found puzzling. 
And at the time, Peter and I had some conjectures that it may be related to strategic disclosure. With some, there we had some reasons why we thought that it might be related to strategic information disclosure. But uh, there is a still a significant gap between what we can show theoretically and what actually need to prove empirically. So let me go to the graphs here. This is no, 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 no. So this is a completely different graph. And here it's, it's a measure of skewness in the stock market. So what is skewness in the stock market? If the returns in the stock market, we follow a symmetric distribution, so a normal distribution, then if I would tell you, you know, it was a, I didn't tell you if it's a positive return or a negative return, I would just tell you the return today was a two sigma event. You would say that it equally likely was a positive day and a negative day. Okay, so again, if it was a symmetric distribution, like the normal distribution, and I would tell you that the return on the market was a two sigma event, and I would tell you, and I would ask you, do you think that it was a positive return day or negative return day? You would answer that it's 50-50. In the stock market, it doesn't look like this. Okay, so in the stock market, that's a line here. If I tell you that it's a two sigma event, okay, the fraction of negative days, the fraction of up days is less than 50%. If I tell you that it was three or four sigma event, it's becoming even more pronounced, more negative skewness. You it's say it's skewed to the left. To the left. Skew to the left, yeah, this is negative skewness. Which says, you know, so on average, on ed every day, the stock market return is close to zero. But more, many days you have small returns. Okay. And with low probability, you have really bad days. Yeah. yeah. But this yeah, is. For sigma, sigma, yeah. Especially negative for sigma. sigma. But yeah. still, I think the negative skewness for the market is, um, by now I think it's pretty, we're pretty convinced that that's negatively skewed. But also true, and people may be less familiar with this, that this is true for the market overall. But for individual stocks, that looks very different. Individual stocks exhibit positive skewness. So if I tell you for a specific, for an average stock, do you think that, given that it was a two sigma event, do you think that it was a positive return or a negative return? The, que the answer would be actually higher than 50%. So the skewness from the com looking at the market, individual stocks look very different, which is quite confusing because the market overall, after all, is just the average of all the stocks. Yeah, so how this end? This is also true. And here it's partitioning this positive skewness when you partition it by size decile. So you say, what is going to be the negative skewness of the smallest companies, the smallest decile, and how does it look for like larger companies? So the positive skewness look more pronounced for small firm compared to large firms. And size, it's difficult to disentangle, but size is also... I'm colorblind. Show me one. Show me one decile and ten decile. Here, uh, they look the same color. So which is one, which is ten? This is ten, this is one. Oh, okay. This is okay. one, this is okay. two, this is three. And so, so it's, it's okay. yeah, so it's almost, you know, almost perfect okay. correlation between size decile and the positive skewness. Yeah, there is some flipping here, but it's... Two sigma, they're all mixed up together. There's no distinction. Ah. So size is, I think, three is a good, I mean, difficult to disentangle, but it's also... Uh, it's also a good measure of how the public coverage of firms. So the more, the bigger the firm is, the more analysts covering this firm, and the more, and the more difficult for firm to be strategic in their information disclosure. What is the, the upper curve? Here? Yes. What is this the is like the smallest day sign. The smallest, meaning the firm, the firms was the smallest, the smallest firm. This is the smallest firm, the second lowest firm, and so on. Okay. So 
first, small firms, I think that the stories about strategic disclosure may apply more to them because they are less covered by, by analysts and there is less public information. There is more scope for strategic information. Uh, so this is our interpretation of this, but not approved, but just uh, some views that we had at the time and still have at the time. And the relation between you know, the positive, the skewness at the market level and the skewness in the individual stock level, somehow, right or wrong, we have this intuition that it's all about correlation. The correlation in good times and bad times be very different. And this correlation in good times and bad times is, we feel that maybe related to this clustering effect of how information is being revealed by firms. So uh, this is, as I said, this is, things that we find interesting. Uh, this is sort of like an empirical picture that drawn by theories, but still we like this picture. And as I said, to be honest, there is, even though that we talk about clustering, there is a significant wedge between what we do in the theory and what actually can you know, really talk seriously about the data. Still, you know, there is a gap that maybe in me, if, if you're interested or someone else is interested, we find really interesting to discuss. That's my disclosure, full disclosure <laughs> statement. I'll stop here. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Thanks.